But here we are, we're in Ezekiel, and it's this Old Testament book. If you are new here or kind of need a reminder for us, you maybe are wondering, if you've not spent a whole lot of time in the Old Testament, you, you may wonder, it'd be kind of a common question of like, is there anything that's helpful for my life now from the Old Testament? I want new. Uh, I don't like the old stuff. I want the new stuff. And so is there anything helpful out of here? And we'd say, absolutely, yes. I love the Old Testament. What the Old Testament is doing is it's telling us not only who God is, it's also telling us who we are. Uh, it is really drawing out for us the fact that where there is a, this, a, a huge disparity between a holy God and an unholy man, and so a sinful man. And so it is pointing us to how does a sinful man have a relationship with a holy God? How do we, how does, what is God going to do about being made right with a holy God? And so the Old Testament is pointing us toward Jesus. And so over and over again, it's pointing us towards Jesus. And it is so rich for us and has so much application as I think we've seen throughout Ezekiel, because Ezekiel is no different in that. Ezekiel is one of the prophets uh, of God. It's another way of saying he's a messenger of God. And so as a reminder for us in the book of Ezekiel, uh, Ezekiel is delivering God's word to God's people. And these are a people, though, that have been chosen by God. They are loved by God. And they have, uh, they've really walked away from God. They, they, they give a uh, if you if you read through the Old Testament, you watch the, uh, the 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 people of God. They they will give a shadow of looking a bit religious, like they kind of follow God, but their hearts are not committed to Him. So they will give a they they'll feign a, a kind of a religious look to them, but their hearts are not walking after them. Very hypocritical. I mean, this has no application for us, mind you, as uh, the church today. But Old Testament, uh, that, that's how they were living and how they were looking. So. Here we are in the Old Testament. Ezekiel is delivering God's word to God's people. And he's been doing this through a number of different ways. He's been giving a number of visions that, uh, that God has given him, a number of visions that will communicate uh, words to the people. In light of that as well, he's also been using some street drama acts uh, to deliver God's word to the people so they would understand. And... He is delivering a word to them that has been hard to hear. They have been walking in sin. They have been walking in their own ways. They have been walking and trying to create their own kingdom apart from God, in spite of even having a, a, a look of being a little bit religious. And so there is a judgment that comes from God that Ezekiel has been delivering to them. And so what we saw as we worked our way through Ezekiel was there is this, this hard question. After God's judgment, is there any hope? They have, they have, they have so walked their own way apart from God. Is there any hope? Is God done with them? And what we have seen in this kind of second half of Ezekiel is absolutely is not done. There is an answer. And so what we've been looking at last week and then today, our final message in Ezekiel is the final vision that Ezekiel has about what God is doing, how God is answering. And so this, this final vision of Ezekiel, it's this hope-filled message to any who are in need of a drink, to any who are thirsty, is this invitation for us. Reminder from last week. In this vision, he sets up a, a whole new temple. It's reflective of what happened earlier in Ezekiel, in chapters 8 through 11, when there is this vision of Ezekiel is brought to Jerusalem where the temple was, and he watches the Spirit of God leave the temple, head out through the east, and he departs from the, from the people there. There's so much sin going on, they don't even know it. 
what we saw last week is a whole new temple in this vision that God establishes, God puts in place there, and he comes in through the east gate and he dwells in the temple. The significance of the temple is it's the dwelling place of God where, where man and God would meet. And so it's this marker of significance. With this new temple is this, this part of the vision that, that we're going to see here in, chapters 40, in chapter 47. Now, let me give you one more thing. I want you to be thinking about these questions. Here's some questions that are going to kind of foreshadow. I want you to be thinking on as we go through Ezekiel 47 and beyond. Here's the questions. With all that you have going on in your life right now, like where, where does this map on to life? With all that you have going on in your life right now, where do you find your strength? Or, or where do you find your hope? Where do you go? And, and where are you going to continue to go? There's lots of places you can go. There's a lot of places that are promising life and hope and a source of life. But where are you going to go? Where, where are you going to find that? And ultimately, the question is, have you discovered and trusted in, like really trusted in Jesus as your source of life? That ultimately is the question. But it's this, this, this under, this driving flow of question that says, where is your, where do you go for your source of life? Or we're going to keep going. Now, let me give you an example. Let's take a, a, a husband and a father. He, uh, just like many, uh, is trying to balance work and family and church and all the different places where he gets pulled in multiple different directions, and he's trying to balance all of those things. Where does he go to find strength and hope? If you, if you knew him and you were to peel back some layers to his life and you look a little bit deeper into his heart, you'd find that he lives much of his life on the performance treadmill. Um, if you've ever heard that phrase, performance treadmill. Um, in fact, many Christians can, can get there. They, uh, they just, they, it's a life of try harder, do better, keep going, trying to maintain and control outcomes of life. It is people-pleasing, uh, a, a, a life of performance treadmill living is a place where uh, there's a lot of times a lot of uh, self-reliance or self-sufficiency. If you were to peel back another layer or two, you would even see at times places of self-righteousness. Where would somebody like that go to find a source for life? Where, where would they find their hope? Where are they going to keep going? See, we're wanting to take Scripture and map it onto our own lives. And so I'm, I'm hoping you're beginning to begin to think there. We get a picture of the source of life for any who are thirsty. And it's here in Ezekiel 47, verses 1 through 12. Let me read that for us. Remember, the Spirit of God has left before. He's now back in the temple. And we pick up this vision that Ezekiel is having. He's being led on a, on a tour. He's, he has a, an angel as a tour guide who is leading him around the temple and the things that are going on around it. And here's what it says in chapter 47. Then he brought me back to the entrance of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. Next, he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around the outside of the outer gate that faced east. There, the water was trickling from the south side. So, out of this temple where God now dwells, there is water that's beginning to, to come out, this slow little stream that's starting to come out, and it's flowing down. Verse 3, as the man 
went out east with a measuring line in his hand. He measured off a third of a mile and he led me through the water. It came up to my ankles. Now watch what happens to this river. Right now, we see in verse three, the water that's flowing out, he's, he's down a third of a mile from where the temple was and the water is, is ankle deep now. Verse four, then he measured off a third of a mile and led me through the water. It came up to my knees. He measured off another third of a mile and led me through the water. It came up to my waist. Uh, He's pretty wet. Verse 5. Again, he measured off a third of a mile, and it was a river that I could not cross on foot, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in, a river that could not be crossed on foot. In this vision... If you know, I mean, we don't have to be an engineer to recognize there is something crazy going on here. If you take a jug of water and I pour it out, right, the further it goes, the less it gets. This is a reversal that's happening. As the water is coming out of the temple, where, where the Spirit of God, as the water is coming down, it's flowing down over the steps, it goes out to the east, and it's going and flowing down. And what we're going to see, it goes down into a place called the Dead Sea. And as it flows down there, it's getting deeper, wider, deeper, and it's eventually to a place that he can't even walk across. He has to swim. He's diving in, and he's swimming across. A reversal is taking place than what is normal in this vision. Now, Keep, keep, keep track with me. Verse 6, and he asked me, so the angel's asking Ezekiel, do you see this, son of man? Like, hey, Ezekiel, did you, did you notice in this? Just think about what's going on here. Check this out. Then he led me back to the bank of the river. Verse 7, when I had returned, I saw a very large number of trees along both sides of the river bank. He said to me, This water flows out to the eastern region and goes down the Arabah. When it enters the sea, the sea of foul water, so it's flowing, this this river is now flowing down into this foul-watered area. The water of the sea becomes fresh. Verse 9, every kind of living creature that swarms will live wherever the river flows. And there will be a huge number of fish because this water goes there. Since the water will become fresh, there will be life everywhere the river goes. Verse 10. Fishermen will stand beside it from En Gedi to En Galim. These will become places where nets are spread out to dry. Their fish will consist of many different kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. Yet its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be left for salt. All kinds of trees providing food will grow along both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. Each month they will bear fresh fruit because the water comes from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be used for food and their leaves for medicine. Keep those things in mind because what we're going to see is mind-blowing. But what do we see happening so far? This water's flowing down, and everywhere the water touches, life. Life comes. Life is coming to where everywhere that this water is touching. And this deep river is flowing down. It's flowing down into the Dead Sea. That's significant. The Dead Sea. Uh, Does anything grow in the Dead Sea? No, it's the Dead Sea. It's below, the Dead Sea is actually below sea level. And so any fresh water that actually flows down into the Dead Sea, everything that was alive there dies because it all evaporates. It has nowhere to go. And so it just collects lots and lots of more minerals and salts. And it becomes just over time, it just, it's unsuitable for survival. Humanly speaking, Adding another flow of fresh water, even if it's a large one, is going to result in nothing but death. Nothing will come of it. But something's different going on here. In Ezekiel's vision here, this river is flowing from the temple and it's bringing life to the Dead Sea. It's bringing life there. 
Look at verse 8. The last sentence in verse 8. When it enters the sea, the sea of foul water, the water of the sea becomes fresh. Uh, Another uh, way you can translate fresh in Hebrew is healing, cure, repair. The water of the sea brings healing. It is a healing water that comes. And so this is just this freshness, a healing water. Verse 10 even tells us the results, right? Fishermen are standing there on all sides of the, of the sea, of the Dead Sea there, and there is life, and there is fresh fish, and there's so many different kinds of fish. It is just good. Where there once was death, there is now life. All around the sea, the river brings life where there was death. And Ezekiel is to stop and think on this and consider this. And what are we seeing? The flow of water from the temple is bringing healing. It's bringing life. It's turning salty water, what's undrinkable, what is hostile to life, into being drinkable. It's life-giving. Original hearers of this are going to be picturing the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. In the Garden of Eden is a river, and at the river there is life. There's no death. There is, this is before the fall, and there is life teeming with, and in fact, some of the same verbiage in Hebrew is some of the same verbiage in Genesis as well as in here in Ezekiel, teeming with life, swarms of creatures, lots of many kinds. It is a reflection of what's going on in the Garden of Eden. And so this reflection of when the very beginning when God created to all the way through, now there is something that is fresh. There is life going on. From where there was death, there is now life. So this this vision of of taking place in the Dead Sea, this river of life-giving waters flowing down to the Dead Sea where everything would die and to the sea of death, but now there's a reversal. There's life. In fact, verse 9 says there, there will be life everywhere the river goes. There will be life everywhere the river goes. How many of you just feel dead He gives life. He's the source of life. This vision is taking place here. The Bible says over and over again, where sin is, death is. Sin brings death. Sin brings separation from a holy God. Maybe another way to put sin is, sin is not just breaking rules. Sin is is living a life centered around something other than God. It's looking for sources of life apart from God. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to find my, I'm going to raise up my kingdom. I can keep God as long as he's, you know, as long as he's along with me for the ride. And the Bible calls that sin. And where sin is, there's death. And if you abandon this source, you abandon the source of life. God is the source of life. He's the giver of life. And so here we are in Ezekiel 47, and we're seeing this life come from the, from the temple where the Spirit of God is flowing in. And you may be wondering, okay, but again, it's Easter. So what does this have to do with Easter? This is pointing to a life giver, one who is alive and not dead, who gives life to the thirsty. Let me just make this really clear. Here's here's the outline of what we've seen so far. One, the water from the temple is the source of life. The water from the temple is the source of life. We've seen that so far. And two, this stream flows from the temple And where the water flows, it gives life to the places of death, where things are dead, where nothing grows, where nothing thrives. 
and this is bringing life. Just like last week in the vision that we were watching, it was like signposts that are pointing to something that is significant. This is doing the same. Watch how this is going to be fulfilled. We're going to leave here in Ezekiel 47 and turn over into the New Testament to the book of John. John chapter 7. As you're turning over to John 7, let me give you the background of what's happening here. This is going to be really important. This is what's going to bring some wow factor. Where we've been in Ezekiel 47, we're going to see what God's going to do and how God's going to fulfill this. In John chapter 7, the Jewish people are celebrating a feast. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths is another way that's sometimes put. But the Feast of Tabernacles is this it is a major holiday. It's the last one of the year. It happens in the autumn when the sun rose in the true east and shines through the eastern gate into the temple. It's this holiday that is celebrating uh, God's provision. It's at the end of the harvest season. And so there is just this, it's a big party. There's music. There is celebration, there is joy, there's lots of prayers of thanksgiving, and they are giving thanks to God for his provision for the supplies that they would need, and they are also praying for God to supply uh, for this next season. They are praying for an outpouring of the Spirit of God. They are praying for, uh, for, for the hope of a Messiah, they are praying for a national independence. This is a big celebration, the Feast of Tabernacles. At this feast, this celebration that's going on, this has been going on for generations, this Feast of Tabernacles. In Jesus' time, now hundreds of years later, from what we read in Ezekiel 47, in Jesus' time, some of the practices and uh, traditions that, that would go on here, a priest would go out with a golden flask that would hold about four and a half pints of water. He would get this water from the Pool of Siloam. He would walk and carry that through the east gate, which is the water gate, and then he would go up the ramp to the altar, and then he would take the water and he would pour it out of the flask over the down, and it would run down the temple steps that would flow out towards the east. That act of pouring out the water is during this feast was a way of the people to pray for both physical and spiritual needs and they're praying for provisions of rain and God's supply and for the Messiah and for God's work. And again, this is a big celebration. That's the background of history that's going on when Jesus is at the temple in Jerusalem. With that in mind, take a look at verses 37 and 38. John 7, 37, on the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. What? Last couple of services, I, I hear like nothing. And, 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 and so, so with mind of what's happened, Feast of Tabernacles, what we just read in Ezekiel 47, what we 
talked about with Genesis chapter one and the living water and there's life on all sides and now there's life on all sides in Ezekiel 47 with this life-giving water that comes from God because God is in the temple and all of a sudden the water's coming out and he stands there and he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. Jesus is pointing and he's fulfilling the very promise that was given back in Ezekiel 47. This is mind-blowing. Just amazing. He is the streams of living water. This is what the Spirit of Jesus gives. Life. Jesus gives life. He's the source of life. He brings what is dead to life. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will have life. At the death on the cross of Jesus, what is going on at the cross? At the cross, the death of Jesus, there is an exchange, a reversal that goes on. It is an exchange of his holiness for our sin. There's a change that happens. If you have believed in Christ, you have the holiness of Jesus put into you, and he takes on the penalty of your sin. He becomes sin on your behalf. What? He gives life. It's a reversal. What we see here in John, what we see in Ezekiel 47, at his resurrection, three days later, living proof of a living Savior who says what he does and does what he says. He gives life. For God is the source of life. Are you thirsty? Do you, do you quench him? I wonder how many of you have been swimming in the sea of death. I wonder how many of you look for the source of life in the desert when he is the source of life. And this invitation, this invitation where he says, come to me and drink. This this coming to him and drinking is a a surrender. You you surrender. There is a, in surrender, there is a giving of uh, up of your self-reliance and your self-sufficiency and finding life on your own terms and you come on God's terms. Because Jesus gives this life now and in eternity to come. It's an already not yet. He gives it now and he gives it into eternity. He's the source of life and the very answer to the very vision in Ezekiel 47. What does that look like? How does that map onto life? I, I told you about a husband and a father who, who would live much of his life on the performance treadmill. You peel back some layers, right? Uh, is trying to control outcomes and manage things and try to find balance and people-pleasing and there is some self-reliance, there is self-sufficiency, peel back some more layers, there's even times of self-righteousness. And, and he dives in to the river and, and begins to drink deeply, the life-giving source and his world is turned upside down. It's, he, he's been drinking freely. He's enjoying what the very Savior gives life. How do I know that man? Because that man is me. 
And as I was thinking about you, I, I, I know so many of your stories. Because you, we, we talk, we share, we share life together. Uh, I've been in some of the prayer cohorts where we, we talk about the stories of God, of what God has been doing, and the stories of God that he's writing, and how you have called out to God, and you have, you have dived in, and you have been experiencing the source of life. I was thinking of of people that have, um, there's some of you who uh, have struggled for a very long time with mental health issues. And in the midst of those very issues, you have, you have dived in to the source of life. And even in the midst of suffering and those difficulties, you have found sustenance. You have found him to be sufficient for your needs for the day. He strengthens you. You find peace in the midst of the very difficult things that you face. Others of you have been in difficult marriages and you have turned to Jesus and you have found hope in the midst of sometimes what is very difficult. Some have experienced abuse in marriages or relationships and you have found Christ to sustain you in the midst of them. Others have gone through divorces. And in the midst of those difficulties, you have found him sufficient for your needs as you have dived into what he offers in the midst of such difficulties. Those who are fearful... I've watched those who have found their identity in their sexuality turn to Jesus and, and discovered something far greater, an identity that God says of how he made you. I have, I have watched you suffer I have watched you struggle. I have watched people with terminal diagnoses. They've, they've turned and dived in to what the source of life gives and found hope. Turning to Jesus as your source of life. He brings life in the here and now and into eternity, and already not yet. What you are experiencing to some degree now, you will experience in full later. Let me give you one more image, one more picture that the Bible gives us of a river that brings life. We see it in the very beginning in Genesis. We see it in Ezekiel 47. We see it with Jesus fulfilling this and beginning this, and it's completed in the very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22. Let me just read for us the last five verses of the first five verses of chapter 22 of Revelation. Here's what it says Watch the connections. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the city's main street. The tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing the nations, and there'll be no longer be any curse. Oh, we read this, didn't we? In Ezekiel 47, the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun because the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. It is hope that we have into eternity, but not just in eternity, in the right here and now. It's our source of life. Jesus 
is the life-giving water now. The Spirit of Jesus. Jesus fulfills this vision in Ezekiel. He's the river of living water. And he invites us to come and drink. Where will you go? Where do you go for your source of life? There's lots of promises of getting lots of sources of life. And Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. This is, this is for you, for me. Let's pray. Wow, God. Wow. Oh, Lord, thank you for the life you give for any who have not trusted in you, who have been going to dead sources. They just feel like their life is dead. They feel like there's no way out of their sin. They've been going to the sources, the dead sources of, of alcohol or to pornography or to... There's, Thousands of ways that we can look for all kinds of sources of life apart from you. But God, I pray that we would be a people that drink deeply, that dive in to all that you have. You are the source. So Lord, may there be people this morning that will turn to you. May we be a people that drink deeply that accept and believe your invitation to come and drink. May we not miss it, Lord. Oh, Lord, have your way in us. We ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.